All right, this is Mr. Peterson with another screencast for AP Environmental Science. Today, we're going into human impacts on species extinction, and this slide is a very famous now extinct species known as the passenger pigeon. These guys are pretty good to eat, sort of like quail, and they travel in such large flocks that they roosted in an area for a few days. Their droppings could be raked up and used as natural fertilizer on farms. One historical account from a person who witnessed a flock of these migrating said that the flock took three days to completely pass him by, and that the sheer number of them blocked an, out enough sunlight to make high noon appear to be dusk. This is a great example to bring up because too often with species facing extinction, we think it's only the species that exist in very small numbers that could go extinct. In reality, any species can go extinct, no matter how abundant it may be today. Now for some math. The extinction rate is the mathematical expression of how many species go extinct as a percentage of a million species in existence. The background extinction rate is a measurement of how many species go extinct due to normal changes on Earth. It has been estimated that the natural background extinction rate is one species per million species per year. Or to say it another way, 0.0001% of species go extinct in any given year. And that's a really low number. There have certainly been changes to the extinction rate over time. Mass extinctions, such as this representation of an asteroid hitting the Earth, kill off large percentages of the species on Earth at all at one time. Mass extinctions usually kill more than half of the Earth's existing species, and they've happened five times throughout all of the Earth's history. Eventually, the species that remain will diverge and form new species, but that takes a really long time. The most recent mass extinction took place about 65 million years ago when an asteroid hit the Earth and changed the Earth's weather and climate so dramatically that the dinosaurs, well, and many other species, could no longer survive. Local extinction is much less dramatic than mass extinction, and it takes place at a, when a small population of a species goes extinct at a small area. There may be other individuals of that species in another population somewhere else, but the species no longer exists in the first area. This is a red cockaded woodpecker, and many of the plantations here in Thomas will have these. These birds are present throughout the south, but because they depend on the longleaf pine ecosystems to survive, if they go extinct in one area, birds from another plantation 100 miles away can't just migrate in to replace them, unless humans trap birds in one area and bring them to another, they're locally extinct. Ecological extinction occurs when there are so few individuals of a species left that they, that they no longer fulfill their role in the ecosystem. The Siberian tiger has a role to play as top level predator. But because there are so few of them left on Earth, it's almost as if they don't exist because there aren't enough of them to keep populations of other animals in check. Biological extinction occurs when there are absolutely no living members of species present anywhere on Earth. The bald eagle, our national symbol, was once close to being biologically extinct. In the 1940s, there were only an estimated 400 breeding pairs left. That's 800 birds. We'll get into how that happened later in the year, but if all of those birds had all died in a freak winter storm, there would be no more bald eagles. Thankfully, thanks to some legislative action, the bald eagle is no longer endangered and isn't anywhere close to being extinct. I like to bring in this example because environmental science can kind of seem gloomy sometimes, but it's nice to focus on total environmental success stories like this. A variety of factors can lead to species becoming threatened with extinction, such as extensively hunted, limited diet, being outcompeted by invasive species, or having specific and limited habitat requirements. Now, as far as how humans have affected the extinction rate, the short answer is that it's no longer as low as the background rate of 0.0001%. It's higher. How much higher is up for debate, but estimates range from 0.1 to 0.5%. That may look like a small number, but a rate of 0.5%, it would take about 140 years for the Earth to lose half of its species. Half. The reason we don't know the actual extinction rate is twofold. First, we don't always know when a species has gone extinct. Secondly, we don't know how many species there are on Earth anyway. We're finding new ones every day. However, we're not finding nearly as many as we're losing. 
and not all species will be in danger of extinction when exposed to the same changes in their ecosystem. Species that are able to adapt to changes in their environment or who are able to move are less likely to face extinction. Think pigeons in cities. They have adapted and thrived in their new urban environment. There are some terms we need to define here that relate to species on the road to extinction. And the first one is endangered. An endangered species is any species that exists in low enough numbers that it could soon become extinct. Next is threatened species are those that are still abundant but have shown a declining trend that if it continues will soon risk becoming endangered. This is a key deer, named so because they live only in the Florida Keys. And they are an endangered species because there are only about 400 of them in existence. If efforts to protect them end up being successful, they could become threatened as they work their way back up to being non-threatened at some point in the future. Now these deer exhibit one of the characteristics of species that are prone to going extinct. Some, many species that are big, slow, tasty, and those with valuable skins or parts are particularly likely to go extinct. It's certainly true of some species, but another thing that can lead to extinction is behavioral characteristics. And these deer have one that makes them more likely to go extinct. Because deer are relatively smart, ask deer hunter, I'm not good at finding them, and they can learn things that help them to adapt. So these deer have adapted to civilization by feeding near roads and thusly eat cigarette butts. Because they get the nicotine rush like humans do, unfortunately, they've learned where the cigarette butts are and have become addicted to them, which leads them to be near roads more often than other species, which ultimately gets them killed when cars hit them. Selective pressures are any factors that change behaviors and fitness of organisms in an environment. Now, in the ways that humans accelerate a species extinction, there are several. The acronym HIPCO can help you remember them. <clears throat> and that, and the H stands for habitat destruction. Clear cutting this forest destroyed the habitat of all the other species that lived in the forest. And if a species no longer has a habitat, it might be able to move to a new area. But at the end of it all, it's more likely to go extinct because its original habitat is no longer there. The H also covers habitat degradation which would be damage to the habitat without complete destruction. Habitat destruction also includes habitat fragmentation. This turtle lives in the forest on one side of the road. Before the road was made, the forest was bigger because it wasn't divided. Now that it has to cross the road to get to the other side, his habitat is fragmented and his species is at a higher risk of going extinct because more members of his population are going to get run over while crossing the road. More on this later. The I stands for invasive species. Invasive species are those that aren't native to an area, but have become established there. In this slide, we have a bird nest with three eggs. They're the smaller ones, and two large eggs with a different spotting pattern belong to a brown-headed cowbird. Cowbirds are invasive, and they pose a risk to the native birds. As the native bird builds her nest and lays her eggs, the cowbird comes in and lays an egg or two into the nest besides the native eggs. Now, many native species aren't smart enough to realize the difference, and so when the nest is full, they stop laying eggs and incubate what they've got. The cowbird eggs are bigger and they hatch quicker, leading to a nest with two big cowbird chicks and three little native chicks. Parent birds pretty much feed the mouth that's gapping open closest to them, so those at the bottom of the pile get less food. After a few days of that, you end up with this situation, where the native parent is bringing in food to the one cowbird chick. Where are the other four birds? They either starved to death or got kicked out of the nest by the largest cowbird. Do the math on this, and it's pretty easy to see why this invasive species poses an extinction risk to the native species. Now, just for some background, in areas where the cowbirds are a native species, guess what the other birds there have adapted and learned? Birds in those areas can distinguish the different types of eggs, and when a cowbird egg shows up in their nest, they usually just pitch it over the side. But invasive species pose a risk because native species can't adapt that quickly to the new situation before they go extinct. Species thrive outside their normal habitat. On occasion, they are beneficial to the native habitat, but most of the time, 
they are destructive. Invasive species are usually generalist, are selected, and therefore outcompete the native wildlife, like these wild hogs. The first P in HIPGO stands for population and resource use growth, and it sort of ties back to habitat destruction. Habitats get destroyed for lots of reasons, but one of the major ones is that humans are using more of the available land to support a growing population. Whatever natural ecosystem hat was in this picture before is long gone now because of the mining activity to extract copper and other valuable metals from the ground. Now back to habitat fragmentation. This is one issue many people don't realize is, well, a big issue. This occurs when large habitats are broken into smaller, isolated areas. Some of these causes are construction of roads and pipelines, clearing for agriculture or development, and logging. This, was a varying, this has a varying effect depending on the species and habitats. Fragmentation by this highway seen here can be very detrimental to wildlife. But in this picture is one way humans have figured out to help solve the problem by creating land bridges that allows wildlife to safely cross, reconnecting previously separated species. The other P stands for pollution. This slide is from around the 1940s. And if you can see on the other side of the truck, they're spraying DDT. DDT was used to kill insects. So in this picture, I guess they were spraying the town to kill mosquitoes. DDT was great for that use because it's horribly toxic to insects, but pretty safe for mammals but it still polluted the environment and led to the near extinction of eagles. Turns out DDT isn't really toxic to adult eagles. They could eat fish that had accumulated DDT in their bodies and the DDT would transfer into the eagles bodies and that was really okay. It didn't kill the eagles directly. However, it did result in the thinning of the eagles eggshells. Take a chicken egg from the refrigerator and if you take off any rings you been wearing and wrap your hand around the egg and squeeze evenly on all sides, you can't crush it. That's how strong eggs are. They're made to support the weight of the parent bird on top while being incubated. DDT made the eggshell thinner, thinner, so I think you can see where this is going. The parent eagles laid the eggs and went to incubate them, and now the eggs were cracking and breaking before the birds could hatch. The breeding population of eagles got done down to about 400 pairs at one point. So far, down that scientists were taking eggs out of nests and incubating them like chicken eggs and hatching them just so there would be enough adults to continue the process. Climate change is the sea for polar bears make a living on the polar ice, moving from one spot to another and hunting seals and other aquatic life. If the climate changed to a point where it became colder and all of the natural breaks in the ice where the bears hunt for food were to freeze over, that would definitely cause a change for the bears. Maybe they could migrate, but it's still more of a risk to them than the natural conditions. Unfortunately, most of the climate change for these guys involves warming and ice melting. So their formerly large areas to roam and hunt have become much smaller. What final factor will cause their extinction if it happens is unknown, but the climate change got the process started. Final O in HIPCO stands for over-exploitation. Many species are used directly for some part, like alligator skin or these elephant tusks used for ivory carvings and medicinal uses. Where it would be fine to take some of these individuals and use some of them, it poses an extinction risk when you take too many of them. To combat the illegal ivory trade, some countries now have established legal ivory where the elephants are protected and their ivory tusks are harvested without killing them. That's creative thinking because it allows the resources to be used, but it isn't being overexploited. As a bonus, when the legal ivory goes on market, it lowers the overall cost of ivory, which drives down the urge to kill elephants for illegal ivory. It's kind of a win-win. Some organisms have been completely domesticated to the point where they now are managed for economic returns, such as honeybee colonies and domestic livestock. This has a negative impact on the biodiversity of these organisms. There are several ways to protect species from extinction, and this is a slide of the American crocodile which is native to South Florida. These guys got pushed to the brink of extinction and were at one point the last century down to less than 40 individuals. Due to protection by the Endangered Species Act, their numbers 
were able to recover and grow to the point where they are less likely to go extinct in the future. Wildlife refuge are another way to protect an area. St. Mark's is just south of Tallahassee, and by setting aside large portions of land and coast for wildlife, those species that live there have a guaranteed area where they can spend part of their lives without being hunted. If you enjoy hunting of any form, of waterfowl or really any organism, then wildlife refuge are crucial for the continued survival of those species. Those individuals may one day leave the refuge and go somewhere where they're hunted, but by protecting them some of the time, we continue to have them forever. Seed banks are collections of seeds or other tissue that could be used to reestablish a species if it goes extinct. Many crop plants can be regrown from a cutting of a plant, so they don't even need the seeds. This is a picture of the International Seed Bank that just opened in the past decade or maybe a little over. It's located so far north of the equator that the ground is permanently frozen, so it doesn't require refrigeration to keep the seeds cold. Every country in the world can send in seeds for the plants that grow there, and they're stored there forever. Seeds that are kept below freezing can actually be planted hundreds of years later and still grow. So these seed banks are the ultimate extinction prevention method. If everything else failed and a crop species like corn or wheat went extinct, at least we'd have the seeds to be able to start over again. Here's a picture of what it looks like inside. The rooms in the back are so far underground that they're well below freezing without using any energy. Here's the inside of one of the seed storage rooms. Different seeds are cataloged and stored away here to protect against ultimate disaster. Another way to preserve biodiversity is to protect it in a botanical garden, which is like a zoo but for plants. If a plant goes extinct in the wild, it might still exist in one of these gardens, and that plant could serve to reestablish a wild population of plants again. Wildlife farms exist too, where species that might be overhunted and driven extinct are instead protected and allowed to breed. These animals raised here can be used to reestablish wild populations if the species become locally extinct in a particular area. Zoos and aquariums also protect species from extinction by allowing captive breeding and some of those new individuals can be reintroduced to the wild. Biomagnification is the increase in concentration of substances per unit of body tissue that occurs in successively higher trophic levels of a food chain or food web. So as each successive organism eats, the concentration of the pollutant increases on its way up the food chain. which is different than bioaccumulation, which is the selective absorption and concentration of elements or compounds by cells in living organisms, mostly, most commonly fat soluble compounds. This is different from biomagnification because we are looking at one organism over time, whereas biomagnification looks at each movement up a food chain. So a pollutant like mercury that can't be removed from your body will accumulate over a lifetime which means we might not see any health issues for decades before it finally reaches a level inside us where it does damage we notice to our health. And with that, I'll leave you with a sunrise at the Grand Canyon. That's it for now. Thanks for watching.